Hey guys, and thank you for tuning in. Um, this is Who Psychoanalyzes the Watchmen. I'm Heather Ness. Um, thank you guys for tuning in to the MomoCon uh, live stream. Um, this is a great thing that um, MomoCon has been putting together since we aren't able to, uh, you know, meet together in person. Um, this was kind of Who Psychoanalyzes the Watchmen. It was kind of a last minute idea that I had um, from watching. Um, the HBO series finally um, binge watching it in a, in a couple of days um, and I think like a lot of us could probably relate to binge watching in quarantine right now so this was one of my quarantine binges and I wanted um, so much to talk to you guys about it so thank you for tuning in um, again I'm Heather Ness um, I go to different cons in the Atlanta area um, like MomoCon, Dragon Con um, and, and some others um, I usually, uh, sport my moniker Super Psych, um, so maybe you've gone to one of my Psychology Of panels before, um, but this is going to be similar to that. So, let's jump in, let's see what we got. So, this, uh, series, or this, uh, this panel that I got here is going to focus on more on the HBO series, uh, Watchmen. It is going to be pretty spoiler heavy if you haven't watched it already. Um, and only a little bit going to get into the graphic novel. Um, so, Watchmen in general, like the the whole franchise, the whole uh, the whole story, the whole world, um, deals with some really deep themes. Um, and I liked the HBO Watchmen series. Because one, it was a more modern take. The the graphic novel was written uh, sometime in the 1980s. I forget exactly the year by Alan Moore, um, and it was very very pertinent for that time. And times have sort of changed. So um, this HBO series was able to, I think, um, get, talk about those themes from the original graphic novel, but make it more applicable to what. Uh, we're seeing in the world today, um, especially what we're seeing in American society today. So, first of all, I I felt like the series Watchmen asked the question, what's the difference between the KKK, um, the police, and superheroes? And the answer could be could be very very simple, in that is like well the difference is, is that some are superheroes, some are heroes, and some are very much villains. Um, but that's where Watchmen goes, right? Who's who? And that's where it gets a little bit messy. So to answer the question, you know, what's the difference between these different groups? They show in the in, in the series the way that they are similar, and the way that they are similar is that they all wear masks. Um, so now in the HBO series, the kind of the shtick, I guess, that's a little bit different from how things actually work in real life, is that the cops. I don't know if all in American society or if it's just in uh, Oklahoma. But um, the police officers are able to cover up their faces um, so that, you know, they're now like vigilantes, superheroes, superheroes, uh, they're able to cover up their face and hide their identity. But the difference is, um, in this storytelling, is that cops are the good guys and vigilantes or superheroes are outlawed. So. They made all of the, these groups, the KKK, the police, superheroes, all of them are wearing masks. So what does a mask do? And I'm going to talk about that in kind of like a metaphorical sense. Um, what it does in a figurative sense, but also what it does in a literal sense. So what it does is it gives us anonymity. We're able to cover up our, our true identities. It allows us to become someone else besides who we actually are in society, it gives us a different persona. So for example, one of the police officers, Angela, who's really kick-ass, 
Um, she, in society, is, she owns a bakery shop. She owns a bakery shop. But in actuality, who Angela is, like her, her essence of herself, is the furthest thing from just like this, this sweet lady who owns this very quaint, cute bakery shop. You know, she, she puts on her persona of Sister Knight as a police officer, and she goes out and she beats a confession out of people. So this, um, a mask gives her or allows her to have a different persona. Um, so one thing to kind of like help us tease apart this idea is this ex uh, psychological experiment that happened in the, again, I don't know the exact date because I'm just really bad with that, but uh, it happened in the 1970s called the Stanford Prison Experiment. You might have heard that. If you ever take like an intro to psych class, it's one of the staples that people cover. And the main researcher there was um, Philip Zimbardo. Um, and Zimbardo did a lot of not cool, unethical things when he put together this experiment. So keep that in mind. Secondly, though, the, like, the premise of the experiment is that he took um, a group of white, uh, traditionally college age, so like 18 to 20-something, um, men from this school... Uh, from this university and he divided them up randomly into these groups and he gave each group a role so the one group was that they got to be the prison guards and these other ones got to be the prisoners and so he gave them these roles he told them um you know he gave them he gave like the prison guards had like their nightstick they had those um very stereotypical aviator sunglasses that um, cops are shown to wear in movies. Who knows if they actually wear them. Um, I think they had like different clothes and things. Prisoners were put into um, very drab um, clothing. Like prisoners are, are like wear to, and then they were only referred to by um, their prison their prisoner number. So their names were taken away. So these two these two groups of men were given these roles. And when they were given these roles, they were also given these expectations. And we had these expectations, um, one from the researcher who was putting this all together, but also like we just kind of have in the back of our heads um, how we think a prisoner is supposed to act, how we think a prison guard is supposed to act. So he took like these very like random guys from this university who like, they didn't particularly have like any type of aggression in their in their background. They um, they were just your average Joe Schmoes. But when he gave these roles of prison guards to some of the men, they changed. They became very different. They acted very differently than what they would um, in their regular life. They became incredibly aggressive and did awful things to the other people who were prisoners. And so, like Zimbardo's plan for this whole experiment was that it was going to go on for weeks but i think he cut it off after just like only a few days so in one hand there's a couple of a, a few different sides to a mask you have the literal sense of the mask um that it's actually covering you up um like a physical literal mask but then you can also think of a mask as just kind of like this persona or the social role that you put on so for example uh say even myself so like my background is is that you know um i have a master's degree in clinical psychology and that master's degree allowed me to then be an instructor at a university for a few years uh, for about four years and then i decided i wanted to go further on in my school and i went or my education and i went back to school and became a, a doctoral student at Georgia State University where I'm at right now um, so at one point in my life I had the role of a professor um, and I acted a certain way in that role and then I went back to school and now my role is student and you act a little different if you're a professor or if you're a student not incredibly different but like there's some nuances there so we we have in our lives different roles that we play and you know, sometimes I'm a wife well I'm always a wife but like 
I'm interacting as a wife or as a daughter. Those are different roles and you, you act differently in each one. So with wearing a mask, putting on a mask or putting on a persona, it can go a couple of different ways. On one hand, you have the Stanford prison experiment where um, it went incredibly badly. Like they were, they were given the role of a prison guard and then they, they um, became very aggressive. Um, you have with the KKK who put on these very cowardly hoods and um, you know they have these same beliefs whether or not they're wearing the hoods and how they're interacting in society but somehow putting on that hood and um, getting in a group of their brothers um, and having that anonymity allows them to carry out these heinous aggressive acts that they can't if they're just like you know going about their life as a banker or something so on that side, the, the, the mask is kind of a bad thing, you, you could kind of say, but you also have, um, I'm sure so many of you are, are probably really missing it right now, but being able to cosplay and putting on, whether or not it's actually a mask, but getting to like role play as this character that you think is really cool or maybe that you admire. Um, I'm not a cosplayer myself, but... Um, my understanding is is that when you put on this other um this costume this the one that you put a incredible lot of work into and is all very cool um but also like you, you're kind of putting on the persona of this character and maybe that makes you feel a little bit different um so that can that can be a cool thing you know if you put on a hero and maybe it makes somebody who's kind of shy or inhibited um feel cool about getting out and going to a, a con with a bunch of other like-minded people and making new friends and then that's a positive thing so these masks these this sort of an anonymity or putting on a different persona it can go a couple of different ways um there's a psychologist i'm sure a lot of you have heard of freud and if you've taken an intro to psych class um, ever you might have heard of this guy too but his name is carl Jung, and he says that figuratively we all wear a mask we all put forth this persona um, in society and this hides our real self very much like angela putting forth this persona of yeah i'm just this cool um, unassuming baker i got my husband and my three kids and nope nope not causing any problems over here that's just me um, but really her true self is very angry she's very angry with how the world works and all the different things that has happened to her and she through her other self as sister knight is able to express that so there's also in the show the character of the gamekeeper and he wears a mask not really to cover up his identity because you can really tell that he is just another one of these clones things that um dr manhattan has made but he wears a mask for a very specific purpose and the purpose is to make him more cruel so again this goes back to this goes back to the stanford prison experiment this goes back to um the kkk or um in the show they have the cyclops they have the calvary who all of them who wear a mask it'll this putting on this this mask and having this sort of anonymity um, masks make men more cruel and he does it for a purpose to make to make adrian right stay on his paradise planet there's another side to masks that i kind of wanted to talk about and they sort of work as a rorschach test so now rorschach is he doesn't come into the show um because he was killed in the graphic novel um but rorschach has um, a mask, the, the Calvary wear it now, where it looks like um, an ink block test. So there are these psychological tests called the Rorschach ink block test, and they're just these, they're symmetrical, but they don't really, they're not really images of anything, they're just blobs. Um, and they are a type of projective test, and a projective test is like, here's, here's this 
image, some kind of stimulus. Um, what do you see? And the point of them isn't really the, there's no right or wrong answer because there's no, there's nothing really going on in the image. They're just vague and blobs. But the point is people will talk about, they will project um, things that are kind of going on with themselves and their own beliefs and maybe their past or like something that's going on with their mental health um, onto this image. So, in a way, masks sort of work as a Rorschach test. So, if you see someone in a mask, what is your gut reaction when you see that person? So, for example, and I know the show, the show was not written for this because the show was written and filmed and aired um, before this COVID-19 ap ap uh, epidemic. But it apply it, it worked not worked really well, but it seemed very appropriate to watch it during this during this time because what we're also seeing as people are going into stores or doing their um, essential business or essential work while wearing masks, we are seeing um, incidences of violence against black men and Asian Americans who are just wearing these respiratory masks. It made me think of, uh, well, the quote from the show, white men in masks are heroes, black men in masks are scary, made me think of what is going on with, you know, there was this African American doctor who was trying to help other people and he was wearing his mask um, and he was, he was arrested, he was stopped by a cop because surely, an African American man in a mask must be up to no good. They must be hiding something and we should be scared of them. Or an Asian American wearing these masks, they must be carrying the, 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 the virus um, and they're hiding that or something. So it's not about what's true. It's not about what's true. It's about what, what is your gut reaction when you see another person in a mask? That's what says the most about you as an individual. Um, we'll talk more about Wade in a little bit, but Wade's character uh, or persona looking glass is very similar to Rorschach in that instead of it being like a like an ink blot, it is just a reflection. So instead of seeing this um, this blob of ink or whatever, um, when you look at him, you see a reflection of yourself. So how, what does that make you feel? Um, somewhat like a projective, te uh, projective test, but the, the stimulus is yourself. So Watchmen, I think the series of it is very essence. If we strip away the mass part as well, it asks us to question our definition of a hero. So Angela's hero was the chief of police and he had a clan's hood in his closet. Um, the very popular and uh, charismatic um, senator of Oklahoma is a leader in the Calvary. And these people who are in power, like the chief of police or the senator, um, people who are supposed to be the good guys, they justify being in these groups, these horrible groups, um, these horribly racist and violent groups, to keep the peace from within. That's how they justify it. Um, but they're not making any substantive change. They're, they're keeping the status quo or even using that violence for their own gain. Um, Dr. Manhattan's liberation of Vietnam, it happens in the, the graphic novel, the liberation of Vietnam is compared to the Tulsa massacre. Um, and in the show, the Calvary, um, which are very, who are very clan-like and they have, they have an, a, a connection to the clan, to Cyclops, um, their symbol, uh, well, in addition to wearing like Rorschach masks and then they quote his journal, um, so you can see that they're kind of putting up Rorschach on some kind of like pedestal or um, kind of idolizing him, I guess, as some sort of... Um, passed away a uh, hero. 
But in addition to that kind of blatant homage, the the Calvary's Cyclops symbol that you see later on in the show, and not they not only include Rorschach imagery, but they have the the symbol from Ozymandias's um, his eye symbol from his breastplate, and surrounding that is Doctor Manhattan's um, atom symbol. So you have this horrible, horrible racist group who everyone like kind of agree like everyone's on the same page that these are bad guys these are bad bad guys but they are playing paying homage to who, who was considered the the heroes so it kind of goes back um to this question of well, what's the difference then what is the difference between these here who we think of as heroes and who do we think of as villains because the line between them has not only become blurred, we've almost taken it all away. So the other, the other part about um, mass, um, and because there's a, there's a lot to get in with it, is that they're used for protection, um, literally and figuratively, right? You know, we're, we're wearing a mask to protect ourselves and others from the virus, but we can also put on. Um, or, or Angela literally wears a mask to protect herself because if people knew that she was a cop, then she would be in danger of the Calvary. She and her family would be in danger. But that's a literal sense, but in a figurative sense, she is protecting herself with her mask from all the trauma that she has experienced in her lifetime. And it and with Angela, it was like one thing right after another. Um, it was just, could, can we, you know, such an amazing amount of hurt. Um, so we can put on a mask or a persona to pretend like we're not hurting. So we can put on a mask, um, a new persona, and become cruel. Or we can put on this mask and become someone confident and heroic, like, like, cosplay or we're put into playing a role in D D or you know children playing dress up they're they're practicing these roles and trying to figure out who who they are um or we can put on a a figurative mask a persona to pretend like we're all okay and to a certain extent that's an okay thing because you could be experiencing whatever kind of hurt but man, like sometimes you just gotta get through your day, you know, and you gotta you gotta be able to go to work or you gotta be able to go to school, you gotta be able to function. And so sometimes you put on this persona that everything's cool and you go to you get your stuff done. Um the pr the the problem comes from never taking off that persona and never dealing with um, you know, whatever hurt that you're you're uh, dealing with um, we'll, we'll come back to this quote a little bit later on but um, Angela's grandfather says to you like healing can't happen as a ma under a mask um, we can kind of like put it on put on a, a persona or this facade that everything's cool kind of like how we slap on a band-aid uh, if we get cut but unlike a band-aid um, healing just doesn't happen on its own um, not emotional healing you kind of got to address it but then there's the also the part with a mask or or putting on this persona there's this other uh, psychological test it's called the marshmallow test so in this the researchers get children and say a child comes into a room and there's um, a marshmallow on a plate and the researcher says to the child okay I'm gonna go leave the room for a little while, probably 15 minutes, five, 15 minutes. If you eat the marshmallow, that's all you can have. But if you don't eat the marshmallow until I come back, I'll give you two marshmallows. And so then they leave the room and there's usually like a funny videotape of a child like trying to figure out what do I wanna do about this marshmallow situation. And sometimes ch children, if they'll just they'll just eat the marshmallow. Some like really agonize over it. Some they cover up their eyes. If you know, if you don't look at the marshmallow, it's a lot easier to not eat it. Um, 
So it's kind of like this experiment um, or, or psychological study in self-control with children. But other people have done the same test and they've told them, you know, think of your favorite superhero or wear the Superman cape. Now don't eat the marshmallow. And when kids either put on the cape or even if they don't even put on the cape, if they did follow-up experiments where they're like, just think about what you think Superman would do. They had an easier time having more self-control because they're like, well, Superman, Superman would wait. Superman would wait for that second marshmallow and it, it helped them do that. So <laughs> we have these different sides of a mask where it can make someone, like a mask makes someone cool and we've seen that. But it can also make someone stronger and it can be protective and it can be helpful and it can make you feel stronger and braver. So what's the difference? And the show doesn't actually offer um, an answer to that and my answer to it is very tentative. Um, I don't think I'm necessarily an expert in it, but I think it's the pers the persona we choose to put on is the difference. Like there's a difference between a child putting on a Superman cape and feeling invincible and a grown person, a coward, putting on a clan hood and hurting another person. So I think it's what we, what is the persona that we choose to put on and the potential consequences from it. So kind of switching gears, but we'll, we'll keep talking about a mask and what it means to each of these different characters. But one of the characters that I wanted to talk about was the character Will Reeves, and that's Angela's uh, grandfather. So he becomes um, the Hooded Justice, uh, one of the first uh, mask vigilantes in the in the Watchmen world. He's the one who's kind of driving this whole thing uh, with this 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 trend towards becoming a vigilante, and so. Um, his his storyline is very interesting because he was there at the Tulsa massacre. He lost his parents and he lost his home. Um, but we first see him, he's sitting alone in a movie theater. Um, and also anyone who, who's tuning into this who's from, um, you know, the, the Georgia area, um, I'm tuning into you guys from, from Macon, Georgia, and this theater is, um, that we see Will Reeves in, is, is the historic Douglas Theater that we have in, in Macon, so that was kind of cool, um, to watch. But anyways, so Will Reeves is sitting in, um, this theater as a child, and it's a little boy, and he's watching probably a movie that he's watched all, like, I don't even know how many times, and... It's of this hero that he identifies with who um, sh <clears throat> kind of unmasks figuratively the, the sheriff in this town. So those the people that he has been double crossing them. And they're all ready to like hang this guy up. And the hero that little Reeves, Will Reeves identifies with is, says, you know, there's gonna be no mob justice today, trust in the law. And so he, he's learned the lesson of trust in the law. So he grows up and even though he is, he's living in Brooklyn in like, I don't know, like the 1930s and 1940s, somewhere around there, um, which isn't like, well, nowhere in America in the 1930s or the 1940s was like super great for black people. Um, but he, he's, living in Brooklyn or this area um, in New York in that time and he wants to join the police force and so he joins the police force even though these people are adamantly against him all these white cops are adamantly against him joining the force um, but he trusts in the law he trusts in the system and he wants to do good within the system um, but then <laughs> these cops who are also in the clan, who are in this, this, not this, the clan, but they kind of have like this weird cyclops operation going on. They, um, they capture him, they hang him up on a tree, um, which is how he gets this, this noose around his neck. Um, 
the clan um, is obviously known for wearing their white hoods, but they would put these black hoods um, on their victims. Um, and so he's, he's wearing this black hood and this noose from, from being hung up by the clan, but they, they do let him go. They cut him down, um, but they're just trying to intimidate him. They want to intimidate him, so he's not pressing into their their uh, into their cyclops's operation or whatever. So that he, I guess, knows his place. Um, and so he sees as he's walking back from this whole thing, and he still has he still he's holding the hood, and he still has the noose around his neck he sees a couple being attacked so he puts on he puts back on the black hood the mask that they put him in and he then and he saves this couple he, at that moment he becomes hooded justice and there's a few things that's going on here there's a few things one is that he has taken this black hood that is a racist symbol and he takes ownership of it and uses it um which is something that we, we've we've seen before we've seen before um in african-american uh culture or language um and it's okay because he can do that he has taken the ownership of it of this of this incredibly racist symbol um the second thing is so we have a white couple being attacked by a white man. If Will had not put that hood on and had, had hidden his identity, if he had just decided to beat the crap out of this bad guy, but a white bad guy, um, he, during that day and time, possibly the day, he, he would have paid the price for that. He could not, as a black man in that time, lashed out and have been seen as a hero he could not have done he could not have protected this this white couple in this way and have been seen by as a hero if he had not covered his mask so outwardly to society he has to play a certain role and the role is that he you know he follows all the rules he doesn't go he doesn't hurt any white people he is a polite police officer who knows his place and that's what he has to do to survive in the society the hood of hood justice allows him to um i mean will's mad will's mad he's lost his family he has seen this aggression um this violence against his people over and over and over and over again against himself over and over again he's mad the, the hood is the only way that he can express his, his anger and protect himself. So, this kind of also leads to this, this other, like, really tragic progression where he, he is, a, as a child, he watches this film that is made by white folk about how a black man should appropriately protect other white people. Um, a little bit of propaganda? Sure, yes. Um, he joins the police force who are white people who should care about him, but they don't. They don't care about him. They even hit, they even hurt him. Okay? So he decides to see justice with a hood and not a badge. So he joins the Minutemen, who are also um, white people in mask, kind of similarly to the Klan and Cyclops, who also don't care about him. They don't care about him, and they he, they don't care about his his crime fighting agenda. They're just using him as a prop. He is told to trust in the law, and he is constantly duped. And it's tragic because he does trust. He, he he goes from group to group to group, trusting that this time it'll be different, and it never ever is. So he has he has a few masks. Um, he has a literal one as hooded justice. So he puts that one on, um, allows other people kind of like um, encourages them to think that he is this white person, which I don't know why people would look at someone in a black mask 
and with a noose around their neck and think, oh, that must be a white person. But okay. Um, so he says, literal one is hooded justice. And he has his polite social one that's covering up his anger. And then they kind of throw this into the show, but they don't really address it. Um, he has a mask as a straight husband, and I don't know if he is necessarily um, homosexual. Maybe he's bisexual, pansexual, I don't know. But he at least is... He's somewhat having this mask of being um, a 100% um, straight husband. And so his his storyline kind of circles back from he had... He was... Um, he was hung up in this very specific tree. Um, he was hung up in this tree um, by the clan members, by the clan cop, Cyclops people. Um, and then he hangs the, the uh, chief of police, who is part of Calvary, using the Cyclops' mesmerizing technology. So it comes full circle, and I think it, it kind of makes you ask, okay, well, if this guy who's had all these horrible things happen to him uses the same methods that his enemies are using, what's the difference? And that one's not something that I'm necessarily going to um, give forth a judgment on, but I think it is something that it asks you to kind of figure out, okay, well, does he stop being a hero? because he's doing the same thing that his enemies are doing, that the bad guys are doing, or, you know, do they have it coming to them? Um, I don't have an answer for that for you. Um, in the graphic novel, though, he, um, there's this character, the comedian, who's assaulting this other woman, this woman, um, Silk Spectre, um, and the hooded justice stops him from assaulting her, which is great, it's heroic, it's great. Um, but then he's not like sympathetic or nice to the woman, to Silk Spectre in that it, he's kind of victim blaming, um, very much so. He tells her to put some clothes on as if, um, it was her idea to take them off. Um, so again, there's a blurred line and I personally am, am very sympathetic to Will, the character of Will Reeves, but there's this blurred line between, um, hero and, and, and villain. There's, um, there's another point, there's another, there's another interesting angle that the show brings up. Um, so during the, during Will's time as a police officer, and this is when he discovers the Cyclops' mesmerizing technology. What they're doing is they're playing these, these strobe lights, like what Will has here, um, through a movie theater screen. And so they use this technology in a black theater, um, only on um, black audiences. And what it does is it kind of hypnotizes them, mesmerizes them to be aggressive to each other. So there's another massacre that happens um, on black people, but by black people, but they're manipulated to do it. So cops arrive on the scene and, and all these white cops are just like, yeah, that's their nature. They're just aggressive and can't control themselves and it's just awful. Um, and Will goes in and he's actually starting to, he talks to people, like they're people, because um, they're his people, and tries to figure out what's actually going on. No one else questions that a theater full of people just all of a sudden starts being heinously violent towards each other, except this one police officer. Um, so he, and that's how he finds about the Cyclops' strobe uh, technology. There is a, there is, or was a, um, I believe he's passed away now, I'm not actually sure about that, but you can look him up. Dr. Amos Wilson is a psychologist He's wrote a number of books um, um, that I, I found personally life-changing um, for understanding society. But he wrote one book and that is called Understanding Black Adolescence Male Violence. 
and he's written another one, Black on Black Violence. And so, you know, these are longer books, and there's a lot of nuances going on here. And he, he goes into like an incredible um, dialogue about it, and and, and and talking about all the systemic um, institutional issues um, that go into racism and why black people might be violent towards each other and so i'm, I'm really condensing this down um, to a short conversation um, but i encourage you guys to look it up about dr amos wilson one takeaway here is that a dominant the dominant white society tells african americans all these reasons why they should hate themselves so and that, it, it, it's almost it's almost like this mesmerizing hypnotizing technology like it's so permeated in society all these reasons why they should not value themselves and if you hate yourself for a list of reasons you're going to probably hate people who are like you if you hate yourself for a for list of reasons that someone has beaten into your head, you are going to also hate people who are like you. Then your aggression is focused on people who are like you rather than the people who are actually causing you harm. So the people who make up these lies about you use your aggression as evidence of your nature so these these white cops who are part of this this group cyclops who are hypnotizing these black people in the theater are looking look look at their violence look at look at how violent they are even against their own people look how horrible they are look at that it's just part of their nature it is like mass institutional gaslighting gaslighting which is 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 twisting reality twitch twisting the truth so that you're not sure what is real what um what is false anymore making you actually question your own sanity so moving on from well moving on well back to angela so angela says to one of her adopted children the world isn't rainbows it's black and white and i think that's kind of an interesting choice of words there um she's it's commentary that she knows that the world isn't inclusive she knows that the world is based on these in groups and out groups so social psychology talks a lot about um you have these in group and the, your in group is groups that you identify with out groups are the groups that you're not a part of so in groups have you know whatever kind of bonds that hold them together um, and then they look at these out groups and they, and they come up for a variety of reasons and we have all kinds of theories that uh, explain why but why the out group is necessarily bad so the she's saying that the world isn't inclusive it's based on these in groups and these out groups Still, even after knowing that her closest, one of her closest friends and one of her co-workers, her hero, are racist, is racist, she continues to be a cop. And it's kind of similar to these politicians who go into the Calvary to keep the peace. And this obviously isn't believable. They're, they're in the Calvary because they're racist and they want power. But like they're trying to justify it with, I keep the peace. So there's an element of Angela thinking that she can do the most good by working in an imperfect system. And I think that comes up where, you know, people complain about police brutality and acts of racism um, that are committed by police officers. And then other people try to counter that with, well, then if cops are so bad and if you know, it's such a, a, a bad group and, um, you know, there's obviously all of these problems and it's racist. Why do black people become cops? And 
they're ignoring the thing of, well, we do need police officers. The society does need police officers. We need people who do actually keep the peace. Um, and people want to make change and it's hard to make change outside of the system. Um, so it is understandable why some people would join a group that they don't maybe 100% agree with. Or maybe they're like Will and they do trust in the law. Um, but they want to do good from the inside. So Angela's had, um, speaking to that, speaking to that and why she might would want to be a cop still. But Angela went to a, a home for girls after her parents were killed at something like a workhouse, kind of like an orphanage. And cops, police officer, caught her parents' killer. The killer also was covered in a mask and a hood. So very, very similar to the Klan catching people and covering them in a hood. The cops also covered the suspected murderer in a hood, which was wild. Um, but anyway, she felt like justice was done. And this led her to want to be a cop. Cops were the only ones who found her parents' killer and did something about it. And from, like, from there, her life is a series of tragic events. She sees p police officers as the only ones who actually get something done. Um, her, so her parents, her grandmother, um, she was shot. She loses the chief literally, and she also loses the chief figuratively when she finds out he's a closeted racist. But she doesn't deal with the hurt except by putting on a mask, which allows her to use violence um, to express her anger. And I, like earlier I was saying, you can't heal under a mask. A mask doesn't work like a Band-Aid. You can't cover up the wound, wait a while, then uncover it and it's magically healed. No. It delays the healing. Um, what's kind of interesting, and I'm going to talk some more about it in a second, but Angela came up with her sister Knight persona from what is called a black uh, black exploitation movie. So this movie, B-rated movies um, that have black actors in them, and I don't think they actually get like paid or recognition for being in the movies, and it kind of like makes fun of of black people and and culture. But that's where she gets her persona from. Very similarly, her her grandfather Will Reeves. He took his name, Reeves, um, to from from the from the character who was in the movie that he watched during the uh, the massacre. So there's kind of like this um, there's like a mirror image going on between Angela and Will Reeves. And getting to that, there's these themes, these uh, repetitive themes in the, the series. Um, of intergenerational trauma. So, g getting at this mirror image, in, in when he was a vigilante, Will pretended to be white, and he he covered up his his eyes with um, uh, makeup to make it make it seem like he was white. Um, and then Angela, when she becomes Sister Knight and puts on that persona, she actually makes her skin darker. Um, when she wears her mask or hood, her, her hood. So in the same way that her grandfather took his hero's name, Angela took her, uh, her hero's name. Um, at the end of the series, there is another massacre, and she is running into the theater, the same theater that Will was in in the original massacre. Um, and he's in, he's sitting there, and he's waiting for her. Um, and everything has become full circle. So there's this theme. Of, of this intergenerational trauma. And one technique, and it's an interesting technique that's used um, in family therapy, and it could also be an individual therapy if it applies, but it's to create what's called a, a family mapping. So it's kind of like a family tree in that you say like how everyone is like related or whatever. And so it shows relationships, but you also include in it different... Um, different people's stories um, if you can kind of reduce it down to that and it helps see 
the whole family system in a big picture way and how um, oddly and kind of amazingly trauma or these stories replay themselves over generations um, in the same way that kind of kind of the same story replays itself from Will um, to Angela. Um, there is a support group um, shown in the series and this man says in it um, and again he's an African American man he says in his support group he talks about how his grandmother's fear has passed on to him even though he hasn't experienced the trauma himself so this is kind of an interesting area that has continued to be researched uh, people don't know everything about it yet It's it, they're working on it um, but how how trauma can be passed on from generation to generation. So to kind of give you an idea of you know what people are, are thinking or what they're researching, you, traumatic experience can literally change our biology. Um, people who have post-traumatic stress disorder or they've gone through these um, traumatic events, it changes um, things, parts of our brain and how it's functioning especially with like you know not just like um like like really horrific trauma um and then if someone's biology is changed it makes sense then that 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 new structure bi biological structure um could be passed down genetically so then also trauma having gone through trauma leads to behavioral change it changes the environment that we create for subsequent generations which then in affects their biology so it's messy and it's difficult to tease apart um and again it's, it's an area of continued research and i threw up a um a link there if you wanted to look more into it i think it's a little um i think it is a little one-sided um there's some very obvious um, 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 trauma that has happened with a particular group of Americans that isn't talked about in this article and I think it's kind of a, a gross oversight um, but it, do, it would give you a better um, idea of what I'm talking about here so she takes Angela takes um, what's called nostalgia and it is people's memories that are put into pill form and at this point in the show it's outlawed but she takes it and she's she takes her grandfather's uh nostalgia so she's able to not only like see his memories but she's like in his memories she she is will and these memories play out and when she's coming out of this and she she's said that she has a, a, a recollection infestation her her brain or her memory is broken from from taking so much of this nostalgia she's told that she can't see her friend, grandfather and uh, lady trudeau who says this says you, you would know where he ends and you begin and i think that that's an interesting commentary on family there especially with the lens of this energy intergenerational trauma and I think also it's just, you know, different cultures look at ideas of identity and family membership differently. Who am I in relation to my family, in relation to my family history and the things that my family has gone through? Um, how have I created my identity based on some of that? Um, so where do I truly begin and where does my family end and some people is it depending on your culture it might not be important for you to tease that apart um, I, another character that I kind of wanted to talk about is Lori and Lori comes from uh, again the graphic novel she was also Silk Spectre not the Silk Spectre who I talked about previously who was assaulted by a comedian that was her mother um, so in the graphic novel, Lori becomes Silk Spectre mostly because her mother wants her to. She's being pressured into that. And then she has a relationship with Dr. Manhattan. 
I didn't really get the idea that she actually loved him or anything, but, you know, like, she has to stay with him because here is this walking atomic bomb and we don't want him to go off. So you're just going to kind of be there for him. Um, so now in the series, she works for the FBI and she's pretty disillusioned with, with masked vigilantes. Um, she's had a really, really bad life. And the thing is, is that in the book originally written uh, by Alan Moore, she doesn't have a whole lot of identity. Um, she doesn't really get an arc. She's just kind of there because they needed a woman to be there. And it's interesting. I like this scene where she's in like this Dr. Manhattan booth uh, to tell him to call him up and tell him jokes to reach out. Um, these booths are for people to send these recordings, I guess, to feel better, um, which I thought was kind of, kind of a commentary about prayer. It was a very cynical commentary about prayer. But um, so she goes to these booths to tell him jokes, and she's telling him this joke, and it, this isn't the punchline, but one thing that she says in the line, or in the joke, she's describing these different heroes who are talking to God. She t they talk to God one by one. And then she gets through the last hero and there's someone else. Um, but it's not a hero. It's a woman. And it's funny because technically, Lori was a hero. She was a hero. She was Silk Spectre. She wasn't really a hero. Like she didn't, she didn't have these any powers. She didn't do a whole lot. She was just kind of there to look really good in spandex. Um, that is the attention that she was given, her character was given. Um, so it's this funny commentary of, well, heroes, you know, a woman can't be a hero. If it's a hero, it's not a woman. They're somehow mutually exclusive. There's also a title of an episode in this series called, If You Don't Like My Story, Write Your Own, which is kind of exactly what they did to Alan Moore. So Alan Moore's, um, The Watchmen was very pertinent for its time in the 80s. Um, it's seen as like one of the best graphic novels ever written. And honestly, like some of the, 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 the visual storytelling is incredibly good. Um, but it is critiqued for how the, fe the women characters are, are written. Um, and I think Alan Moore never really wanted a sequel to his work. He never really wanted other things uh, to be done with Watchmen. He just wanted it as a standalone graphic novel. Um, but people didn't like the way that he handled the women characters in his stories so they wrote their own and they wrote Laurie into you know a pretty cool character she's not just um strong and forceful and funny and interesting um but now she's also lonely and, she, and she's dealing with that loneliness now so i said i was going to talk about uh wade um looking glass he wears this reflective mask uh, causing a similar effect to the Rorschach mask. Um, except this time the, the projection test is yourself. What is your gut reaction when you're looking at yourself? Um, so he, his backstory actually takes place during the Watchmen time when Vite kills 3 million people. Um, and during all of that, he just he screams at himself. He, he, is, he is misled by this woman who takes him into a fun house. And seems like she's going to hook up with him, uh, but doesn't. She just steals his clothes and runs off, and he's left there, um, just naked in a funhouse. And he starts screaming at himself um, in a looking glass for being dumb and a sinner. Um, and now he's a cop, but he became a cop only after this White Knight incident when when the cavalry um, goes into the houses of a bunch of cops at night. And shoots them and, and afterwards they're allowed to wear um, mask or cover up their face so why wasn't he a cop before that and it's he, he answers that he wasn't a cop before all that because it wasn't until after that ju justice needed to be applied but a lot of justice really did need to be applied like bad guys happened before the cavalry came into people's houses um, and were shot up but something about wearing a mask and being able to hide enticed wade 
to become a police officer. So now he's he's a police officer. He's looking glass. That's his persona. He watches people. He's able to pick up on body language. He can tell if they're lying. Um, he runs this interrogation pod, um, flashing these American images um, during an interrogation. It ends on a Rorschach image. And so he, he asks these what's called bias questions and watches people's physical responses to these images um, to tell whether or not they're lying or if they're trying to have something to hide. Um, Lori calls the pod a racist detector. So w Wade is the one who runs that, which is very interesting. Um, why him? Maybe he's invested, I think, in learning how to tell when people are lying so that he's not fooled again. He was lied to before, and he was caught with his pants down. So all of his security measures, his mask, which is supposed to block out psychic energy, all of his alarm systems that he has, his fallout shelter that he has, um, could be seen as not wanting to be fooled again. His mask, you know, we talked about the different sides of a mask, is literally protection. He wears his mask at home. He wears it at his fallout shelter. You know, he, he's, he's traumatized from this blast event that supposedly happened and his mask is supposed to block a psychic blast. So he doesn't just wear it because he's hiding his identity from the Calvary who wants to hurt police officers. He wears it to protect himself from a possible psychic blast. But he's fooled again and captured by the Calvary because of a woman. And again, like Will Reeves, his story became full circle. Will Wade's story went full circle. He's caught with his pants down again, just not literally this time. So he's still afraid of the psychic blast, even after finding out the truth, even after finding that it didn't actually happen. And he leads this extra dimensional anxiety support group. That's the support group that the one gentleman was talking about, um, his grandmother's trauma and how it has been passed down to him. So Wade has what psychologists refer to as, an, as some emotional intelligence. So there's this theorist, um, Howard Gardner, who theor theorized that, you know, there's not just one type of intelligence, we have different types of intelligence. And one of it is emotional intelligence. Um, not only being able to tell, you know, what's going on with other people and how they're feeling, but maybe also being able to understand your own feelings and how, um, you know, how you're dealing with that and being able to interpret them. So he has this emotional intelligence that helps him help others in this support group um, and also read body language for lies and how to tell if someone is getting nervous or stressed out or hiding something. And he's asked, why isn't everyone petrified um, about aliens falling out of the sky? So like in the, sh in the show, I guess this thing that Vart did, it killed like three million people um, that happened in the original Watchmen graphic novel was that he just dropped this squid, this giant squid on New York and there supposedly was like psychic blast energy that caused people to just die um and now to kind of keep that that charade going Vite just dumps a bunch of tiny squids randomly somewhere in the world so people will be driving along and then squids will just fall out of the sky they stop their scar their cars and they just do their windshield wipers and then it stops and then they move on with their day. And Wade is asked, Why isn't everyone petrified? How have we why do people act normal when squids, baby squids, are just falling out of the sky and then they dissolve? And then we're that's just our new normal. The thing is, people can get used to anything. Ongoing trauma has its effects, has its ongoing effects, um, even after you get used to it, but people can get used to it. And what I mean by that is that sometimes if you're in a traumatic situation or an abusive situation for a long period of time, that trauma, that abuse is your normal. Not that it doesn't 
continue to have effects on you. Not that it's not continuing to be awful, but your body just kind of adjusts and it gets used to like, this is the level of stress that I'm going to deal with constantly, which um, has some long-term physical effects on your body. But people, ad- people adjust and they recalibrate. And now this horrible thing that keeps happening is our new normal. And we'll just carry on as if it's okay. The last thing that I want to talk about is kind of this relationship between um, Adrian Veidt and Dr. Manhattan. So Dr. Manhattan creates this paradise on uh, a moon of Jupiter, Europa. He creates this paradise and he creates these Adam and Eve-like clones who just have this undying adoration for their creator but he's unsatisfied with that basically he made adam and eve but he didn't give them free will so he's unsatisfied with their undying adoration so he lets adrian run it surely a narcissist would be fine with undying adoration but the thing is is that for adrian it's boring I didn't get into a whole lot with Dr. Manhattan in this uh, in this panel, in this presentation, but his development to me kind of, and this gets a little religiously, religious-y, uh, but it's kind of like God and, and Jesus, Jesus in the whole Judeo-Christian uh, way. So he creates, he destroys, uh, he leaves, um, but he comes back, um, but this time as a human. He's trying to masquerade that he's not actually Dr. Manhattan. He's Cal now. He's taken on this this new persona. And technically, as Cal, Dr. Manhattan is wearing a mask. Um, which kind of made me think, you know, maybe God was wearing a mask um, in, this, in, in stories when he came back as Jesus. Um, and I think, that the, I think that's what the writers are trying to get at. They're trying to get at these kind of like bigger existential things not just societal uh, issues but kind of like these existential um, questions so the clones that Vite put on trial uh, put Vite on trial and that kind of made me think like if people put God on trial this is what it would look like and I think kind of like God he gives no defense of his actions so in this again in this like existential way people ask you know if there's a loving God why, whatever you want to call him, but if there is a loving God, why does he allow these things to happen? Why did the Holocaust happen? Why is there so much pain? And people ask these questions, but if there is a loving God, he gives no defense of his actions, much like uh, Vite doesn't. Um, and I talked about the gamekeeper, how he wears this mask um, to make himself more cruel, so the gamekeeper is the first man that Dr. Manhattan made. And he is upset. The reason why he's the gamekeeper and he's so bent um, on Vite staying is because he's upset that Dr. Manhattan, his creator, his father, left. And he asks, why is heaven not good enough? His original creator left. So now out of hurt, he keeps Adrian there. And I think... I think at this point I started taking a step back and asking why do we create these sort of larger than life these mythical stories of good and evil and heroes and villains and I think that we do we create these these massive stories of heroes um, like the Watchmen or, or, or Superman or uh, you know, whatever heroes or um, these fantasy epic level stories, I think we do that to work through these universal themes that we all, that we all can relate to. Like if a supreme creator created the universe, then where are they? Um, why did they create a world with such pain? These questions that have no real answer. So instead of solving them, which we can't, um, we create stories ourselves. We become creators ourselves, and we um, we use them to work through our own our own existential questions. So at the beginning, um, 
of this presentation, I mentioned that Carl Jung thought that we all wear masks uh, or personas to hide or protect our real selves in society. He also turned the idea of the collective unconscious, and that is this idea that there is this human, this universal human experience. Um, and kind of like how individually our um, anxieties sort of come out in our dreams, maybe it's kind of like hidden in certain things like oh my I had a dream that my teeth fell out so I must be anxious about um, something else going on kind of like how we interpret dreams like that our universal he thought Carl Carl Jung thought that our universal human anxieties come out in our stories and we kind of see that with some of the existential questions um, that are brought up with Dr. Manhattan and with and with Byte in in this HBO uh, series. So I'll leave you on that really uh, deep note. Um, existential crises and universal human emotions. I'll leave you with that and thank you guys again for tuning in um, for this panel. I appreciate your attention and and your listening and being interested. Um, let um, Momocon know how much you appreciate um, the work that they're doing to put on this um, this Twitch stream for us. If you want to find out more about uh, what I do, you can check out my website at superside.com um, or find me on social media. I'm on Twitter. Um, I have a Facebook page and, and I'm on Instagram and I love interacting with people. I love talking about comics and superheroes, video games, anime, whatever, whatever you guys want to talk about. I enjoy um, just getting into stuff and you can find my book also on Amazon. Again, thank you guys for, thank you guys so much for listening and um, please stay safe.